Roger that. I'm having a bit of a problem seeing it, so I'm just going to let the boat drag it back there. Okay, that's all the Okay, Atlanta is clear of the vessel. Roger that, Hercules, dive, dive, dive. Aziz, late. Give me some late. You got lights on? Lights are on. Oh, you gotta tilt your camera down a little. I think we're good, thank you. Thank you. Iris action. This is an audio slate for dive hotel 1960. UTC time, hour two and 58 minutes. Mark. Till we get to 50, or you want to hold now? Either way, let's wait till we get to 50. <coughs> Make that the new standard. Because uh, technically, we are still within uh, propeller range there. So 
so if we make it, you know, 50 to deck and deck to 50, it's it's cut and dry. That's your new procedure? Yeah. Oh, winch is slow. Yeah, I will, and uh, after we change over. Right? Control, or deck control, copy that. We're ready for the winch up here. Copy that. Okay, we have control, paint out. Thank you, deck crew. Right, cheers, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, let's not do the stick for the first until we get everything in the box. So if you watch my utility and you pay out to uh, match me. So put your hand on the stick there and keep an eye on the winch itself and uh, all the numbers and all the ground faults and all the other stuff we're watching. The other thing you're watching is um, our tail to tail. Make sure I'm tight all the way. I'm not, you know, coming loose and getting wrapped around the axle there. Especially for the first 50 meters. <coughs> yeah, we're watching a lot of stuff. Okay, Daryl, I'm hitting the dive salvo. This again for number two. We're also watching those gauges to make sure we don't bleed to death in the first 50. Why is that not on? I did, yeah. It did. I'm dive salvoed up. Somewhere around two hurdy, you can think about putting that stick in there, but don't rush off to do that right away, especially if we're in weather. You're going to want to, you know, we don't have a lot of weight on the wire yet, so we only got, you know, the weight of Atalanta, so um, you want to be ready to stop right away. If, if we take a good bounce right now in the weather, especially during weather, um, you know, a cable could be hitting the deck or could come off the sheaves or something like that. You don't appear to be moving at all right now. You're all stop, are you? Roger. Why can I get my sea key? There it goes. Hey, look, I can see the uh, first... Uh, Quiver. Okay, well, hello, four to eight. How's everybody feeling? Good. <laughs> everybody feeling good? So with um, 
doing great. <laughs> with other ROV systems, <laughs> the magic number back is in the water. somewhere around right. 250, okay. 250, well, especially a free oh. fire. So everything that, a lot of the things that are going to go wrong are going to go wrong in the first and last 300. I'll relax a little and get you know, that 300 squeeze and everything's turned on and everything's still green lights. All right, when we're ready, why don't we go ahead and start with our introductions and then I have a follow-up question. Your favorite song of all time? Oh, jeez. Your favorite song. You can't choose two, only one. Your number one favorite song of all time. Let's go. Um, hi everyone, my name is Corley Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. <laughs> Um, favorite song. I feel like it's so hard to choose well, that's because also a good thing we have it's now, different just every in day. case we do the right. jam or something goes pear shaped. We got um, you know, our 30 meters there, and our 35 actually. But I suppose if I had to choose one, um. Now it's about the time I usually ask, how deep is it here? It would be <laughs> Where She Goes by Bad Bunny, because I've been listening to that one a lot. Oh, okay. Where She Goes by Bad Bunny. Let's go. What are, what's our depth here? Target depth's 2511. Bottom depth, unknown. Are you going to make me read the dive sure. plan? Uh, what's the bottom depth here? Good evening, oh, everyone. I'm out. Brian oh. Kennedy. I am the watch lead. I'm a deep Stand by ecologist chat. with um, Boston University and the Ocean Discovery League. And I will go with Going the Distance by Cake. Oh, oh good. Thank you. Oh, wow. Going the Distance by Cake. Going the distance. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Chris. I am the data logger here on the Nautilus. Uh, favorite song is a really tough one. I've got thousands of them. But I'm going to go with Stand By Me by Benny King. Ah, uh, hey. Okay. Well, chat, if you're wondering why Katie sounds different, I'm. my name is Annie Halleck. I'm currently uh, temporarily sitting in for Katie. Um, I am from Pango Pango American Samoa. I'm an educator at our local high school teaching marine science and biology. Uh, my favorite song, I think my go-to, um, it's uh, Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. Yeah. And then let's go with our front row. When you're ready. Front row. Hi everyone, I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the Hercules chair. And my favorite song is um, on a total blank there. What's your favorite? <laughs> What's your favorite song, Lynette? <laughs> my favorite song? I don't know. <laughs> I have to like look at my Spotify and see what is the top played song. Or your go-to. Sorry, we don't. We don't have the bandwidth for favorite <laughs> songs right now. We're trying to get the ROV down to the sea bit. No worries. Ren might have it. Ren's got it. He's he's a good multitasker. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm trying to keep up with you right now. That was a cop out. I admit it. <laughs> My favorite song right now is uh, getting well overplayed. Uh, Written by some Canadian dude, something about uh, Mars. Could run away to Mars. Oh, hi.
That's interesting. Why is that thing doing that? Why, why, why? So sweet. So for those listening, we are diving down. We're at about 120 meters right now. And we are heading to okay. unna or diving on unnamed guillot number 13. Target depth is 2,500 meters. Thank you. I was just looking that up. Uh, we should be down here for about 16 to 18 hours. Sorry, Ren. I am. Um was doing something really silly here. <laughs> Come up to speed now. And one of the reasons that this GEO was chosen was because it has a possible submarine uh, landslide feature. Did you say landslide? Lands landslide feature. Submarine landslide feature. Hmm. Or, or that could be your favorite song. The Could landslide be. brought you down. Okay, I'm up to uh, 20 some meters a minute where I should be. I had the wrong button pressed. <laughs> you should have slapped me. I was. Say something. I had two issues. Uh, So what's your favorite song, Katie? What was yours? I said Going the Distance by Cake. Oh, sweet Lord. Loopy, what was yours? Um, I didn't say mine. Chris was here. So Ooh, what is your um, favorite song, though? My favorite song is um, Jolene by Dolly Parton. <laughs> I knew it! Yes! <laughs> Such a great song. Yeah. And I know you are a huge Dolly Parton fan. Yes, I am. Ooh, uh, I would say Help by the Beatles. Okay. I love it. Just like the classic blending of some basic instruments, you know, guitar, bass guitar, and drums. And it just sounds so beautiful. You can peg it at 30 there, right? When that turns yellow, you're going too fast. Ooh, we have a viewer online who says it's Mr. Tambourine Man by Bob Dylan. That is another really good classic. So, Loopy, how did you get into Dolly Parton? Was it like something that you, um, you just loved her from a kid or like in recent years rediscovered? Honestly, I don't even really remember. I just know, like, I've um, I've just seen her, like, in movies and stuff, especially that one movie, Joyful Noise. Oh, um, I've never seen that one. It's a really good movie. So, yeah. I did, I yeah. Give me a like second. I'm playing with stuff, the controls here. And, um, it was like, hmm. So I started, like, listening to her music and stuff, and I was just like, oh, like, I like this. This is a vibe. Yeah. And stuff. So just, like, after that, just... I fell in love with her music and stuff, so. Yeah. I like her story where, like, she was writing lyrics from, like, a strong feminist point of view, like, mm -hmm. way back at the very beginning of her career. So she would write one, like, really strong feminist point of view song, and then she would write the next one of, like, hard work and man. And she would just do all these different points of view, and she did it so beautifully well. It's a it's another movie like, called uh, on Netflix called Dumpling. I love that movie. I love it too. Oh my <laughs> gosh! I true. Okay, so when they announced that Jennifer Aniston was going to be playing in that movie, I had some severe reservations, mm. and I was not nah. But she did such an amazing job, and like listening to the accents on the movie 
uh, I was like, these are these are some true accents. Yeah. Like, it's not the Hollywood fake accent. Like, these are real. Yeah, you can stick it now. Yes, Dump One is one of my other favorite movies. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know, I just got into it. And <laughs> I, um, I'm actually on the hunt uh, for like, because uh, I have yeah, a, I'm right at 25 there. Uh huh. So I'm on a hunt for like a vinyl of like Ooh. her songs and stuff. That's a um, good one. I've yet to find any for real. So, yes. But I have Dolly Parton shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a friend who's gotten to listen to her live in concert and said that she is such like a masterful storyteller. Like the whole time you're just like listening in to her every word and she'll like just strum one or two no notes. Like she has various instruments that she'll play. Yeah. So, like, she's one time playing a lyre, and then she'll play her guitar, and then she'll play, like, a flute. And I'm like, whoa, Dolly. <laughs> yeah, I would love to, like, meet her in person. Um, still going to Dollywood is still a dream of mine. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Oh, I've never, like, unless she's going to be there, I don't you really You can speed up a tad much. there. I'm up to 30 now. We got, like, 32. Okay, so have you ever seen the movie The Best Little house in Texas. I think so. It's got Burt Reynolds in it. Right. I just recently watched this movie and it was based on my home county. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, just recently watched it. I thought it was the funniest, sweetest movie ever. And it's got one of my favorite songs, uh, Hard Candy Christmas in it. I don't, I don't think so. Ah, I just thought I'd figure this thing out. Can I help you, Dan? Wow. That's quite the oxygen minimum zone. Oxygen concentration is one. I think I've heard of this movie, but I never actually watched it. If you get a chance, you definitely need to download it. Definitely need to watch it. It is so cute, and it's really, really good. It's not, like, the name is pretty vulgar, mm -hmm. but the movie itself has, like, no vulgarity whatsoever. Okay. And Dan, I'm not sure if you know, but we have your uh, special salvo on your purple right. Well, already, it was Ooh. good being here in the meantime. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, I was Bye, Luby. fascinated by the winch. <laughs> <laughs> Tested and works. No, but I'm still kind of fumbling around in there, but I, I can. It's not intuitive yet, but I can fumble through. I managed to get the winch up here using it, because I don't have it on my. I've. I've been dumbed down here on the. I don't know why. But yeah, I'm happy. I really like that touch panel. It's the best thing since sliced bread. It's a new toy. It's got like hundreds of buttons on it. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Chris, what was your favorite song? I missed it. Yeah, so oh, if you can keep it well, uh, I have, I single love music. digits there. I've got so lots of favorite songs. Your but I had to pick one, and so I picked uh, Stand By Me by Benny King. <gasps> That's so a really, really good one. I was listening to that one earlier good. today. That and then Unchained Melody by the Righteous Brothers. Uh, that's another one of my favorites, too. Good so one. Many favorites. Yeah. You're I'm actually... I'm a big oldies um, fan, too. Me, too. Like, so many of those early oh, yeah. 1960s, late 1950s. Yep. And, like, that's the hard I thing. If you just type in 1960s, I feel like you miss the whole late 50s. Yeah. yeah 30. There's a, there's 30s are uh, typical yeah. descent speed. Once everything's right, we're through the oxygen minimum zone and the uh, thermocline or whatever. We should be able to make 30 <laughs> on the way down. So we have a viewer online who says that Both Sides Now by Joni They're Mitchell is so their favorite. So now you can see her. Oh, there. that's a good song, too. And you can see the wavy tether. I've never so really listened to Joni Mitchell. Silly, which oh, that's I have my first concert. Um, was it really? To, well, not my very first concert, but... You know, the one so I Bob usually Dylan, keep Joni an eye Mitchell on is the Van Morrison. blinding... Wow. Uh, the Gorge Amphitheater in George Washington. 
Ooh, so I beautiful typically venue. go down with auto heading I spent off, 10 years pit. filming Sasquatch uh, every year in the pit. Oh, no <laughs> yeah. Dodgy if That's I'm not really paying cool. attention. I'm really jealous. Uh, because if I slack off my forward way, it can Oh, here's a good one. Carry, spin around. carry on my wayward son by Kansas. As long as I'm watching that, I'm okay. So it weather vanes on the way that down. That is a depending really, on really good one. Song. So if I have auto heading on, it'll weather vane around and then one lateral's working way harder than the other, and that's stealing our uh, ability to go down, you know, stealing some of our jam. So, yeah, with, with that off, we should be able to, and just a little, uh, maybe 10% you know, forward or something like that, so all I need to keep the tether tight. 10, 15%, somewhere in there then uh, it should come up and stabilize at 30 meters a minute. So Amber, what was your first ever concert that you went to, since you were just talking about them? First concert, oh yeah. my gosh. We heard Chris, it sounds epic. Definitely a little bit jealous. into the Wayback Machine. <laughs> <laughs> that is my brain. Uh, What's Lynette got going out to the world over there? What control room camera she got? Oh, me? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh <laughs> camera four. Amber. I know, we're twins. <laughs> now you're, we're sandwiching you too. <laughs> uh, the camera four, this Perfect. guy here. I can tell you one of my favorite concerts, which Ooh, was I will take uh, your favorite concert. A Leonard Cohen, <gasps> just oh. three hours set. Phenomenal. Masterful storyteller, masterful yeah. musician. Yeah. Horrible singer though. Oh, hey. <laughs> no, like he is a true musical genius, and we all need to bow down to this man's greatness. Like the gravel's nice though. Yeah, that deep gravel. It's part. Voice. It's part of the storytelling. <laughs> I'm definitely one, like, I enjoy listening to his songs be sung by other people. <laughs> well, there's his uh, al early, like, 60s album, Avalanche, Ooh. which is, that song is, like, my favorite. Okay. Yeah. I like the up. story of him, like, uh, when he was writing Hallelujah and just, like, sitting alone in his underwear, banging his head on the floor, like, why can't this song just come out of me? I know it's going to be a great song. I just can't get it out. And I love it because him and Willie Nelson, who is Texas icon, like they both say the same thing. Like, it's not hard to write a song. You just pick a melody like a string out of the air. And I just think that's so cool how they both describe it. Like there's melodies flying around in the air all the time. You just gotta reach up and grab one. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> Making a melody over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, clearly. <laughs> What's your favorite song, Adam? Favorite song? If you have to pick one. Dude, that's super hard, isn't it? I know. Yeah. We just had a viewer say across the universe yeah. from the Beatles. Yeah. Anything by the Beatles. I'm a huge fan. I will shout out on, on Professor Longhair, who's a New Orleans a jazz ship? pianist, and his song Tipitina. Okay. I want to look that All up. All right. Yeah. Professor Longhair. I do like the New Orleans jazz band Tuba Skinny, because they always have, like, a really strong tuba tuba line in there. Mm. And being a tuba player myself. Are you are not. Dead serious tuba player. What? That's that big thing you've been carrying around. <laughs> huh. Got my little pocket tuba. <laughs> <laughs> no, I played like a, um, they bumped me up to high school band when I was in eighth grade for playing it. And then it paid for a good portion of my college because did I really care about playing it at in college? No, but prodigy, it, holy cow! So uh, what? Uh, what? What <coughs> musical pieces have a good tuba solo in them? I don't know. <laughs> mainly, <laughs> mainly, what I love about tuba is it's super easy, and you always need like a low bass in every single song. So for me, just sitting there and playing one or two notes the entire piece. Bump, bump. 
Pokemon. That's exactly Pokemon. it. I grew up like listening to a lot of polka bands because like we have a strong German heritage part of my community, and like, yeah, polka bands every which way you went to. Well, I played trombone in middle school and high school. My and I, my son just picked it up in whatever yeah. in fifth grade. Ugh, such a cumbersome <laughs> instrument. <laughs> So do you let him play inside the house, or does he have to go outside with all the stray cats? Uh, I let him play inside, but the dog does not like it. It runs and finds like a <laughs> corner to hide. Because <laughs> he's like pretty, he's a pretty aggressive tuba player at this stage. Not a lot of nuance in his. Mm, just a whole bunch of blowing really loudly, mm -hmm. hoping he can find a note kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think he can reach the like, <laughs> last position. <laughs> play an instrument? Uh, currently I play a little bit of harmonica. I play a little piano. I played the trombone when I was yeah. little. Uh, you know a couple of chords on the guitar. Okay. And I can bang some drums. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't really play an instrument well. So. What about you, Amber? Well, I grew up playing the flute. Oh, uh, see, that is a super portable instrument. It is portable. <laughs> uh, I always wanted to play cello, though, so I picked that up later in life, and so that's something I play on now in a recreational way. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to, like, do a starboard, larboard, kind of reunite the band, except featuring harmonica and ukulele. Oh. I don't think I know what starboard larboard is. That is That's the, the ship's band. band. Yeah, yeah, Nautilus ship band. Oh. <laughs> Samantha used to be on it. Tim Burbank. I've. That's all I know. Been yeah, fortunate enough tour. not to. <laughs> not to be subjected <laughs> to starboard larboard. Yeah, apparently you can like look up Nautilus Live, and there's like an entire album of different musical compositions. Oh, interesting. So a couple of other people have written in that their favorite song is Long Time by Boston, Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, and Fleetwood Mac might have a tuba solo in it. I Google, Dr. Google to the rescue. <laughs> Coralie, did you, oh wait, never mind, I take it back. Did I watch? Okay, I wanted to get you, let you get situated, sorry. Um, what is your favorite song? Oh, I think I said a uh, Bad Bunny song earlier. Oh, which one? Bad Bunny song. Oh, okay. Uh, where, where she goes. I like the new one, Mi Pregunta. Oh. That's a great one. That's a good one for like someone's birthday to like bring their cake out to that one. Like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, what did you say your favorite song was? Help by the Beatles. Ah, nice. Like classic, okay. beautiful arrangements, so many different sounds all just kind of melding together, that classic vibe. Love it. <laughs> <gasps> Ooh, I'm really glad you didn't say that on this. <laughs> Ooh. My, yeah, I think my blood pressure went up a little bit when you said that, too. <laughs> oh, and also, what is the very first concert that you went to? The very first concert I went to was a Santana concert, uh, and I was oh. nine years old. <laughs> Such a good one. It was sweet. Respect to your parents for that. Yeah. I'm assuming it was your parents that took you. Yeah, I, no, I went by myself. <laughs> Nine years old. <laughs> Nine years old. <laughs> no, yeah, my, my parents took me. Um, it was super fun. There was like, everyone was like dancing and like, no one cared about seats. Everyone was dancing in the aisles and everything. Yes. Ooh, oh. what the is that a heck is fang that? Tooth? I don't know. Is that, that a fang tooth? Weird. Where's Brian? I know, he's eating. Ah, uh, jeez, Brian. Okay, hold on, let me see if I can capture that highlight. Ah, bang two, question. Weird fish. 
Okay, hopefully I captured it in enough time. I don't know. He just went in and out. <sighs> okay, so we have somebody else who said, Rihanna, now what? Or, I'm sorry, what now? Rihanna's Darn you, good. dyslexia. <laughs> so we have, like, a really great outdoor venue place called Brewster Street Ice House. And they have, like, really, really good up-and-coming artists that play there all the time. And there's, I always kind of love it when I see, like, little ones who their parents brought them and they put them in like the little kid earphones. So uh -huh. they're like up there just shaking their little their little diaper booty uh, right <laughs> next to the speakers. It fills me with so much joy. Oh, um, Brewsters, I yeah. miss you. I'm coming back. I feel like I see that at Coachella a lot. Like our music festivals, like people will bring their babies and like have like tiny headphones on them and then have these whole extravagant like photo shoots with their babies. I don't know. Influencers, man. Oh, I don't know how to feel about like such an adult music festival with little ones. Honestly, it's not as adult as you think it is. There's actually kind of a lot of families there. Yeah. I actually really like the the music. I've been a couple times. Um, I really like it. It's just really hot. Isn't so it really right in the to, middle like, of a uh, of a desert? Yeah, you definitely have to make sure your kid is staying hydrated. Which, like, if, even That's for me, hard. like, I'm just like running around trying to see as many people as possible. Like, it's hard for me to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it's like bringing a child. But you know, more power to you if you can manage it. You got any good shows coming up this summer? This summer, mm. okay. So, probably, like, the next concert I went to was a Gypsy Kings concert, and I think cool. they, like, kind of do shows every summer. Yeah. I think they're doing one in somewhere around Boston, so I'm definitely trying to go to that, so... Cool. That'd be a lot of fun. I don't I like know that. if anyone's listening online and wants <laughs> to go. I'm <laughs> going to go by myself, probably, but... Um, we have a couple more songs. So, we have Muskrat Love by Captain Antoniel. And Mind Spin by 311. 311. <laughs> is that it? What is 311? They're a band from like the late 90s, early 2000s. Oh my god. They're is that the one that did the thing with Kesha? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, that was like. Um, Wasn't that like 808? No, 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 no yeah. that's a. Yeah, nope, no, 303. 303. Three yes. Or something like that. Yeah. I'm a hardcore <laughs> Kesha <laughs> fan. To the song with Kesha. <laughs> I don't know. Some of these are classics. The Kesha song is a classic. I, okay, her, I do like how after she did like her 2012 craziness, she is like, it like kind of was Lady Gaga before Lady Gaga started like experimenting with everything. So she did like a gospel album. She did a country album. She did like a back to her roots album. Like, did you hear the one she did with Tony Bennett? Yeah. Oh, uh, wait, Lady Gaga? Yeah. Yeah, I watched the entire concert. Oh, really? Oh, my god. It was really good. Yeah, I love it. And then, like, to hear the story behind it where um, his, like, his mind was so far gone. And so they had all these contingency plans for the shows where, like, if he comes out there and if he has a, an episode or a fit, like, what do we do? If he comes out there and he forgets how to sing, here's what we do. Yeah. Perfect. And so, like, oh. Cool. Did, I didn't know any of that. So. Yeah, like, that was his last concert. Didn't he die? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. But, like, um, so I know there was, I love Lady Gaga because she had all the classic outfits from, like, the big band era. So one of the funnest weird concerts I've ever been to, because I always like the really unique ones, is so we have a retired aircraft carrier called the Lexington and Corpus, like, huge tourist attraction. And they had a, every year for Valentine's Day, they have a 1940s big band swing. People come dressed up from the 1940s. And it's just like this epic party. So you can buy like, they have the cigarette girls. Uh, and you can go buy around like a pack of cigarettes, even though it's not cigarettes. It's, um, you just give them a dollar. And then you have like Rosie the Riveter and you can pay to dance with Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> and she like knows all the classic dances like the Jitterbug and the Charleston and West Coast Swing. And like hearing the big band play. Oh, cool, it's that sounds so like cool. a ton of fun. It was so much epic fun. The only bad thing is at the end of the night, they set off fireworks and like you were in a contained space. <laughs> 
So that's a little bit, that's definitely like, okay, time to clear out the room. Uh -huh. But I loved it because uh, it is like a big, one of the things is it's a fundraiser for like the local VA and people who can't afford medical s the supplies. Um, and so you have these older, older generations who have all veterans who've served their times and they're in their wheelchairs or they're in their walkers. And you know, these people can barely walk anymore. And then all of a sudden they'll start playing like a huge big band song. And next thing you know, they're out there on the dance floor. <laughs> and it is just so, oh, that's great. yeah, it's so heartwarming to watch. Oh, somebody's in Aransas Pass. Hello, Aransas Pass. I see you. So Aransas Pass is a really, really fun community. Got great fishing. Okay, maybe you can help me out on this one, Chris. Aja, A-J-A -A by Steely Dan. Yeah. How do you say it? I think um, Aja. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like Steely Dan. Oh, okay. Some, I just read a Reddit post on uh, Steely Dan the other night where it was talking about how, like, as a kid, nobody could understand Steely Dan, and now that they're an adult. I Actually, I agree with that. I have a greater appreciation for Steely Dan in the last 10, 15 years than I did when I was younger. I didn't wasn't too big into them earlier. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was another one. Um, Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I've heard is another one of those. Like, you can't appreciate him as a kid, and then as an adult, like, fully formed, had life kind of kick you in the teeth a time or two. Now you're like, <laughs> yes, I understand you, Bruce. Bruce. The boss. <laughs> yeah. So we have a couple more. Um, the Last Resort by the, Ingle, by the Eagles. Day on the Green by the Eagles. Linda Ronstadt, Loggins, Messina, Simon Garfunkel. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. How to Disappear Completely by Radiohead and Beneath the Smiles by 12 Foot Ninja. So cool. So Chris, what are some music festivals or concerts that you're looking forward to this summer? Um, there's one that I'm going to, and I just recently started going to with a group of friends called Timbers Music Festival. Yeah. And it's a smaller one, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I had a really good time at it, so I'm looking forward to that. If I can afford it, yeah. I don't know if I'll be back. I think I might leave before it, but there's a big one called Bumper Shoot, and it's a big festival in Seattle every year. I've heard of that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the first time I went was $30 for the entire weekend. Oh, my God. Now nice. it's like 350 bucks for the yeah. whole weekend. I felt that way about um, South by Southwest and Austin City Limits Music yeah. Festival. Like I've heard that. It's done the oh. same thing. Can't do it anymore. Yeah, I and wanted then to go to that one. That one sounds so. I mean, they both. I've heard of both of those. They they sound so fun. I would recommend South by Southwest over Austin City Limits, just because South by Southwest is downtown. It's more fun. It's more concentrated, and there's like, I don't know. To me, there's more stuff to do because you can just wander off. Uh, so I worked at a haberdashery uh, in downtown Sixth <laughs> Street for South by Southwest, and it was so interesting. Like, you get to see Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, 1974. Like, um, so many people just kind of walking around incognito. And you're like, oh, it looks like you haven't showered for a week. And you're wearing all black with a big thing of sunglasses. You're probably a musician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, going back to the Beethovens. Yes. What did they say? Ninth Symphony? Mm-hmm. Honestly, the best Beethoven symphony is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And I wrote a whole paper on this in undergrad because I took a Beethoven <laughs> class about like how amazing this symphony was. Can you hum the melody for us? Oh, I can't sing, but you should look it up. It's great. It was also featured in The King's Speech, if anyone has seen that movie. Yeah, that was a good movie. Okay. What did I, I didn't sing last night. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> So we got another one, Piano Man by Billy Joel. And I will say that the rules are set up in such a way that if any industry survey comes across any potential shipwreck, they also have to report it to the federal government. So we have a really good index 
of every industry survey, anything that looks like a shipwreck, they turn over to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So we have a really, you know, it's the best piece of map seafloor and deep water seafloor probably anywhere. Maybe the North Sea is an exception. Um, so we also just know where all the potential shipwrecks might be for the most part. Who are the ones collecting all the seafloor mapping data in the Gulf of Mexico? Are they done by private companies like oil and gas, or is it done by NOAA? Both. Um, both definitely occur. Uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management sponsors some of the stuff. The oil and gas industries all do a lot of their own surveying. Um, NOAA has certainly done a significant amount of surveying out there. Um, but the, the entire shelf continental break out to the border of the US EEZ pretty much is mapped now um, in high resolution. It's pretty amazing. That's awesome. And that really has changed in the 10 years, 15 years I've been doing this. Um, when I was working in the Gulf for the first time in 2011, um, it definitely wasn't like that. And now it is pretty much anywhere you want to go, you've got pretty good maps. Are those maps available to anybody that wants them, or do you have to um, apply for them or pay for them? Are those maps available to anybody who wants them? Yeah, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, I, th I think they call it the Gulf of Mexico Cadaster or something like that, um, is available just for download. Cool. Yay, Gulf of Mexico! I hope my buddy from Aransas Pass is listening to this. Owen, we got a comment in saying that ONC, or Ocean Networks Canada, saw a whale fall today. Very nice. Oh, cool. Where are they at? Uh, Vancouver, off of British Columbia. Canada. Canada. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Said that one up for you. <laughs> oh, but I'm not seeing anything from today. I see old whale fall stuff. Yeah, so this week, Ocean Hours Canada's got a project going on. We're diving, and Falcor 2 is just leaving um, Costa Rica and headed out, and we'll start mm -hmm. diving, I think, tomorrow or the next day. Yeah, we're uh, about to do a Zoom call or uh, an interaction with the Falcor 2, and then I forget the other parties involved. What is it? There is a museum. A Bishop Museum Bishop, in yeah. Honolulu, yeah, I believe. Honolulu. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we have a good tip uh, about how to take care of the ocean. Every time you go to a water site, take a bag and pick up garbage on the shores and beaches. That is an excellent one. <laughs> Picking up trash is always a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's good to get that at the source. Like there will always be more plastics, but the less plastics that are used and produced, uh, the less that will make it onto the beaches. So I was helping, uh, I was a teacher editor for a textbook, fifth grade science textbook in Texas. And one of the teaks in Texas, they, they're just about to change, is ways that humans can hurt or help the environment. And so this chapter in the textbook, as I was reviewing it, um, we started off and we're like, okay, we're gonna talk about how we need to get rid of single use plastic and make that a suggestion. And then, <laughs> Over the several months that we were working on developing this textbook and like editing it and everything, we had to change it to pick up plastic. Don't. <laughs> so we had to get rid of like saying no, don't use plastic uh, to pick it up. Pick up plastic <laughs> on the beach. It's a, It's really. It's Because re plastic is um, a byproduct of oil and gas. It's a really <laughs> interesting nuance, though, that while. 
reducing plastic is, is a worthwhile goal. If you trade it for a reusable um, bag, you have to use the bag so many times in order to equal the carbon footprint of the plastic. And so the nuance here is are you trying to reduce ocean plastic, which is a major problem, or are you mm -hmm. trying to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a major problem, and the cho you make different choices depending on which one of those you're uh, prioritizing. So it's a, it's a really complicated situation when you think about conservation and the nuance of you know, which aspect of conservation are you trying to do? There's rarely a one-size-fits-all, this is best. Um, everything comes with trade-offs. Um, making the policy, advocacy, and knowing what to do in your daily life really quite difficult. But I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier. If you can just have open conversations with everyone and realize that everything is a shade of gray, there's so many nuances. Just having open dialogues with others yeah, absolutely. I mean, the mining practices that went into the battery on my electric car are probably yeah. very questionable, and the recycling ability of my electric car battery probably isn't all that good, but my electric car is electric, and I have solar panels, so it works really well on my car, but if uh -huh. you're living somewhere that is burning coal, you still have a more efficient vehicle than you would at an, as a... Um, <coughs> a normal internal combustion engine, but it's far less environmentally friendly than my car, which I plug into my solar panels. Yeah. Okay, so apparently Ocean Networks Canada is finding a lot of really cool stuff, and I want to fact check some of this stuff online. Hey, Daryl. Hold on.
Cool. Hey, we're getting close to the bottom. Way to scare the pilots. <laughs> okay, okay. Like 700 more meters close to the bottom. Uh, Dan, what do you want to talk about during this lovely blue water dive? <laughs> And is that Rin in Hercules' seat? Hey, Rin, congrats. Oh, very cool. I am Dan now. <laughs> So, Ren, are you going to be Dan for the whole dive? That's very unlikely, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Until, like, you're going to be Dan during the descent and for the sandy bottom part? Uh, potentially. Depends on uh, the geology. I'm still very much in Hercules training mode, so if it gets to complex stuff, i got to get back in uh, the Argus chair, or the Atalanta chair, excuse me. So for those at home, Ren is our ROV intern who is crushing it. And this is day 14, no, 17, I believe, of you driving Atalanta. So now you're transitioning over to Hercules. So cool. I did have a good time driving Hercules. <laughs> it's very, very fun, if not a little bit stressful. So what's the most stressful part, part that you have figured out so far? Like what are you just like, oh gosh. I mean, all I just of it. Don't want to crash the the uh, very expensive piece of equipment. It's easy enough to get from point A to point B, but I found it to be extremely difficult to uh, focus and zoom in on a very small point. So when science would circle something, be like, let's look at that. I desperately try to get it in frame and mostly fail and feel bad that I was <laughs> disrupting the science mission. Yeah, it's not like you're using a, you know, $100 a minute of bottom time or anything. Stop, man. <laughs> Just <laughs> psyching me out. What organisms have we seen so far in this watch? Lots of little jellyfish that we haven't been able to uh, ID. That weird just fish. Fly by. Yeah, that one weird fish. I hopefully have got it in the highlight reel, but I don't know if I caught it in time. But yeah, a lot of lot of blue water. Then some more blue water. There have been a couple really big, pretty siphonophores that have come through. Mainly, you see them in Atalanta's view. You have more time to focus since Atalanta's camera is downward mm. facing right now. Kind of just, kind of just blow by in Hercules' view. Would you like that camera adjusted? Uh, <laughs> if you want to tilt it down a little bit, yeah. If you want to put it just above the porch, we can get a little more shot of and seeing anything that comes by interesting. Okay, copy that. already been on watch for two hours now. Have we? How? Um, Feels like I'm, I just got started. I'm counting from four o'clock onward, okay. and now that it's six o'clock. Oh. Oh, technically I was here 
early. So you've been on watch even longer. Yes. So Ren, when you're when you're maintaining your distance separation between the two vehicles, are you primarily using high pack or are you primarily using the sonar return off the other vehicle? Uh, it's a little bit of both, to be honest. That is kind of a lame duck answer, but it really is situational. Sure. He's in the Atalant. He's in the Atalant to AFCAM. Actually, copy. Do you want me to come around clockwise? Copy. What is the coolest thing y'all guys have seen on a blue water dive before? I would say the sharks. ROV attacked by a squid. Has that really happened? Yeah. We were north of, Gulf, uh, north of um, San Juan, Puerto Rico in the Puerto Rico Trench and had about a two and a half meter whiplash squid come out of the blue and grab the light bar on the um, on the vehicle and hold on for a little while. Whoa. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I think that takes the cake. <laughs> well, it was the funny story about that was it happened and I was all excited that, you know, we were going to get a lot of play on the internet, and I literally got the video clip and went to send it to shore to our social media manager, turned on my computer and saw the video of um, of the sperm whale with Hercules in the Gulf of Mexico happened the exact, or happened 12 hours earlier. I thought and that was the uh, asphalt flower when that happened. Nope. No, nope, that's a different one. Um, but, uh, but I was all excited we were going to get a lot of play in the media on the internet and uh, Nautilus stole all of our thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and rightfully so, the sperm was amazing. So what lured in the squid to y'all guys? Because I know there was, what, back in 2019, 2021, when they did the giant squid in the Gulf? Yeah. I, yeah. don't, I don't know. I, I don't know because generally the large squid seem to be pretty shy um, when when the groups that have tried to do giant squid stuff, they're, they're generally going in with all their lights off as quiet as possible. Um, and so it was, I was certainly surprised to see a big squid, you know, kind of come after the vehicle. I also had a whale shark come up to Ooh. an ROV in, uh, in the blue water. We were much shallower, we were two, three hundred meters, but suddenly the whale shark was just in, like it just passed us basically, and just like out of nowhere, the whole forward camera was just whale shark. Wow, that would be so cool. Chris, favorite thing that you've seen on a all of our two blue water dives. <laughs> yeah, I was say my blue water dive experience is pretty small. I don't think I've seen much of anything, but I have in other. When I've been out in the blue water, I've seen uh, a big pod of melonhead whales. It was pretty cool to be in the water with them. Oh yeah. And I've seen dolphins and some big sharks. Oh cool. We got a, a slightly better shot of it too. 
Oh, you can see those little dots. <gasps> Whoa. Jeez. That's awesome. For those at home, wow. Brian's showing us a picture of the whale shark in the ROV. How deep is it? Do you know? 200 and something, I think. Wow. Cool. Man. Man. We just passed 2,000 meters. Yay, we only have 500 more to go. So maybe we'll see a shipwreck with a Dumbo octopus on it right outside of Atlantis. Sounds great. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Love it. Daryl, what do you want to see this uh, this dive? Uh, huh. Some crazy, uh, maybe some more, maybe a whale. That'd be kind of fun. Ooh, setting our expectations high. Okay, yeah. We're back here with Atlantis. Shipwreck and Dumbo octopus. So, yeah, the whales guard the gates of Atlantis. Oh, if we're gonna go that way, let's go mermaid. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, we already had one sighting. We already had one sighting of the mermaid earlier today. <laughs> Happy Chris birthday, TJ. Mermaid. Oh, <gasps> we missed cake. Yeah, I was gonna say. Oh did no, we did miss cake. We missed the cake. What kind of cake was it? I have no idea. Cake oh. flavor. Cake flavor. The cake. Well, Wait, happy Lynette? birthday to both of them. Let's see, Lynette, I think, had the latest lunch out, or dinner out of all of us. What um, was the cake I didn't have that? cake, though. Oh, did you see what kind it was? I just saw oh. them frosting it. It had white frosting. There was, like, <laughs> part white frosting, part chocolate frosting, and okay. I think the cake itself was, like, a white cake. I, I think it's probably one of a similar cake to what yeah. I think it's similar. Okay, yeah. so another pineapple cake, maybe? Pineapple. Okay, I did not I taste pineapple, pineapple at all with that cake. How did you not taste pineapple? There was I did pineapples. not get pineapple. I got... There was, like, small chunks of pineapple, too. I don't... <laughs> I think we're eating different cakes. Maybe it was, like, a two-in-one kind of cake. That's fun. Maybe you should have tried some of my cake, because I liked my cake a lot. I didn't like my cake. But I did like the icing, so the white and chocolate icing would be a, would be a good one. Mm-hmm. I guess it'll have to be a snack when we get off. There you go. Yes. But yes, you're you're so right, Daryl. There was one mermaid merman sighting today. <laughs> I'm very proud of my work. I spent a grand total of three minutes creating that. Beautiful piece of artwork. Thank you. Oh, I thought you were going to show me a merman. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Oh, that is awesome. What is that? I think it was a whiplash squid is what we decided it was. What is it called? Visual splash? Whiplash. whiplash. Oh, whiplash. I like that name. Whiplash squid. That's so cool. Cool, cool. I do want to see the movie Whiplash. Oh my gosh, I just watched that recently. How was it? It was really good. I liked it a lot, actually. I really want to watch it. What's the name of the main dude? He was also in um, Top Gun Maverick. Oh, Miles Teller. Yeah. He's like an amazing actor. He's good. Yeah, I'm impressed. I feel like I watched him. I feel like he was on like Disney Channel or something when I first started watching him. Ooh. Okay, you know. look that up. I will look up Whiplash Squid. Maybe he wasn't on the Disney Channel, but that's how I remember him. Wow, this is like a long, skinny red octopus. Wait, I don't think he was on Disney Channel at all. I don't know why I thought he was on Disney Channel. He's done a lot of movies. Oh, Spiderhead, I did like him in that one. It was on Netflix. I haven't seen that one or heard of it. It uh, has Chris Hemsworth in it. It's really, really good. It's based on a book. And it's, um, people can have a choice of either being in an experimental, like, um, drug treatment facility, or they can go to jail. So all these people choose to be in this experimental um, drug treatment program, and there's, like, no, it's really, really interesting, because it sounds like paradise. There's, you know, you're assigned to be the chef, you're assigned to be the janitor, and then you rotate after a month. And so there's no locks. Everybody's just kind of free to do what they want, so long as they're not violent with each other. 
and they have to go in like once a week to test out this new drug and it's a different drug every time really really good really interesting Inter yeah I, i've never heard of that movie before it came out last summer definitely worth a watch on netflix chris hemsworth acting in it like he's doing a lot of comedy bits mm -hmm. really really great is it a comedy no it says it's a thriller uh, kind of a dark comedy thriller. Like Miles Teller is super serious and Chris Hemsworth is like this kind of a mad scientist. Mm. I'd call it a, like a suspenseful thriller with a little comic relief. Okay. Yeah, did you watch it? Did yeah. you like it? It's enjoyable, yeah. <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> Is that your clearly okay, a standing so ovation know, like, from Brian. Yeah. <laughs> it was adequate? Is that the term? Yeah, I was like, what's the Brian, I love this movie. Is it like adequate? It was okay? Oh, it's I'd I watch love it that again. movie. I love it. What movie do you love? Definitely not Little, <laughs> Little Mermaid. Uh, no, definitely not Little Mermaid. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I love the Star Wars series, mo almost all of them. Oh, those are good. Even um, the new ones? I s well, which, which set of newest? The newest ones? Yeah, definitely. Wow. With a like set up seven eight nine. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Wow, I'm not really? awesome. I feel like everyone doesn't like those movies. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I really like them. Great. Uh, I thought they were really good too. I like them a lot. I you gotta watch Legends. One. You gotta read through the Legends, and it'll tell you why not to like those films. Star Wars Legends. What is Star Wars Legends? Basically, an uh, George Lucas, uh, George Lucas's alternative version in book form of those films. They, uh, so if anytime you hear legend, that means the old version of Star Wars. Or original. Okay. But now, uh, canon is referring to what's going on currently. So those films would be considered canon. I don't understand the lingo, but I watched the most recent new one, which I guess was seven. No, nine. No, nine. Oh, yeah, you're oh, right. Oh, wait, but then they did, like, um... No, wait, one, it was six, seven. Six, seven. No, 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 no. Seven, There's eight, nine. There's nine. Seven, There's eight, nine. There's seven, eight, nine, yeah, yeah. So I watched the first one, so it shows seven. Seven. Oh, I see what you're saying. The most recent the in the most, trilogy. The oldest one the oldest in one the, the new, new trilogy. Of the new trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that still had, like, what's her name? The woman who played... Oh, Princess? Carrie Fisher. Yeah, Carrie Fisher. Yeah, that was one of those turn off in the movies for me where like spaceship exploded and she's flying through the space, flying through space using the force. I was like, mm, no thanks. But <laughs> it was all right. I can't it even remember right. it. I just watched it one time and I do remember liking it. And then I remember never seeing just I, not for like any particular reason, but just like never going to the movie theaters to watch more Star Wars. I watched all three in theaters. They're all right. Like, it's definitely Disney Star Wars. Other movies I would say I love, The Martian. The Martian. <gasps> the Martian was good. I Such saw that good one, one in theater, and that was Same a great here. one to see in theaters. Yes. I read the book in, like, eight hours. Yeah, so did wow. I. Had, I got it. I had it on, like, reserve at the library because it was checked out, and I got it, like, at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and I didn't move from the couch until, like, 8 or 9 that night and finished it in more or less in one sitting. Whoa. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a great book. Let's see. Did George Lucas write these? Interesting. 68? Good lord. That's a lot of books. How long would it take me to read 68 books? Long, long, long time, like the rest of my life. It takes me so long to read one book. I haven't finished, I've finished one book and being, since being in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like three years and I've only finished one book. But what kind of books are you reading? I feel like if you're reading like a technical nonfiction. Oh, yeah. okay, if we're counting like textbooks, then I've finished a lot of books, but if we're, I'm, I'm, I'm counting like fun reading, 
fun reading one, and it was Seven Fallen Feathers, um, which is a great book for um, anyone looking to cry. Oh, <laughs> no. It's like, a, so the person writing it is, um, she's like a, she's like a news reporter or something. Uh -huh. She like is like a journalist, but she's writing about like, uh, like these seven deaths in Canada that happened at those um, at the schools. Yeah, those schools. What are they called? Oh, the indigenous community ones. Uh, right where they would re educate. Yeah, the re-education camps. Yeah. Um, oh, those are heartbreaking. Um, yeah, it was it was really hard to read, but I really really liked it a lot. Um, and I, yeah, I've been having kind of a hard time reading nonfiction. I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm with you there. Or reading, sorry, here. reading fiction. Oh, so, oh, never sorry. mind. I'm having a hard time reading nonfiction Sorry, I've right been now. having a hard time reading fiction. So I've been like, the last couple books I've been reading were nonfiction, which are really good, but always like really sad and depressing. And so now I'm reading a book that's, <laughs> now I'm reading a book that's fiction. I actually like it quite a lot, so. If you want a nonfiction book, I'm about to put Guns, Germs, and Steel on the ship library. Didn't you say that one was boring? <laughs> it's a really good book. It's, it is. It's, it's really, really amazing. good. Yeah, but the if guy you're not does in the mood for it, it can be a long read. Yeah. The insights and the information are good. Mm -hmm. yeah. The individual minute to minute, it is not a page turner. No. Yeah, I don't know if I can do that. I want something where I'm like invested. I want something easy to read. Yeah. Something that, like, when yep. I'm out here, I can just quickly pick it up and just be like, bloop, that sounds good. Yeah. Do There's we? a great book on the shelf called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Okay, question. Is that, I know that's Dr. Bowler's favorite book of all time. Is that genuinely a good book? Yes, I okay. think so. I loved it. I read it a bunch of times as a kid. Okay. Because I've read Frankenstein a couple of times, each time trying to fall in love with this book. Oh, oh I like Frankenstein, Frankenstein was too. bad. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like okay, it that well much. Okay, well, maybe you would like it. I really like Frankenstein, too. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, what other books do you really like that are old classics? Uh, lots. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth was a cool one. I haven't read that one. I like a lot of D.H. Lawrence books. Who's that? Uh, he wrote, like, Lady Chatterley's Lover. and. Oh, I want to read that you know, book. Good. Um, I didn't even realize that was a thing until like two years ago when I was watching this TV series called The Midwife, and I, yeah, that's a plot point in there. They're, I think they're good. They're kind of slow. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I, I like a lot of books. I've read a lot. So, <laughs> so do you read a lot on Palmyra? Uh, yeah. What I else read. do you do? There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, you look at the coconut yeah. crabs eating, I don't know, eating stuff. And try not to get and try dodge the falling coconuts? Yeah. Yes. And the coconut crabs move kind of slow, so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody said that guns, germs, and steel has been very discredited. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, interesting. And Daryl, somebody said that the Star Wars Legends is a must on a ship library. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> now I need to start reading the, like the, mo <laughs> gotta go through and just individually read each, each one. I've gotten the summary for each one online, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. to, you don't have to read the whole thing, but I think I want to go on a trip to actually read them all. Well, I hear Palmyra is a really good place to do a lot of reading. It sounds <laughs> like it. <laughs> well, when I get back home, I'm going to read up on a new book. <laughs> Triple oxygen isotope geochemistry. Oh, that sounds like a real page turner. Mm -hmm. Like um, just a thriller beyond compare. Yeah, I'm never going to know what's going on <laughs> next in the story. <laughs> so, so on Brian's scale of it's all right, it's okay, and loved it, what would that be on the Brian scale of interest? I mean, I mean Oh, well, my, my your textbook? It'd be pretty freaking low because that's not my science. But if we're going to talk about <laughs> ecogeography of the ocean by Alan Longhurst, now that is a masterpiece of a textbook. <laughs> I 
I read a book over Thanksgiving break that was so good called Head Full of Ghosts. Holy Moses. I brought it out here to read it again a second time, and I'm like, I want to start reading it now, but I'm saving it for the airplane ride home. But it is a masterful piece of work. I love it. Oh, thanks to the person that sent in the Guns, Germs, and Steel Revisited. Two hundred meters remaining. Yes. So for all those who say that we need to start talking about science, we will in two hundred <laughs> meters. Okay. I'm reading this article on um, guns, germs, and steel re reconsidered. Interesting. So, Chris, going back, like, I do like some of the classics, like Fahrenheit 451. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's great a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've Animal never heard Farm. anyone say it that way. 451. 451? Yeah, that's how I normally hear it. Oh. Um, Animal, what Animal is Farm. Because you, you like Stephen King, right? You I love Stephen King, yes. And you don't like Stephen King, right? Okay. Correct. Ooh. Have you read 1984? Yeah, I love that one too. That That's one's one of my favorites. Holy moly. Brave New World. Brave New World's really good. That one's a really... I want to go back and reread it. Because like, I think I read it the last time. I want to reread it since the 2000 political cycle if that makes sense and like hmm how close was this because i remember there's that very famous scene about the religious iconography where they enter into like that tent or and they see like the weird religious displays so i'm like i want to go back and reread it and Sounds scary. brave new world i've never heard, i've never read it really really interesting i thought i had read it but you're what you're, you're descripting i might be confusing it with another book uh talking about i'm an alpha i'm the greatest yeah. ever I'm a, I'm a gamma. Ooh, right. I'm just a little gamma. Okay. Yep. And um, then they have like that scene at the end where they go, oh, it's been a while. But it's like some weird religious stuff that's pseudo political. Yeah, that I don't remember. <laughs> I remember not understanding it at the time and just kind of being like, ah, I will skim through these pages. Maybe I will read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea if it's sitting right out there. Did you deposit that book? I did not. That's okay. been there for a while, I think. Oh, I, I think, think Daniel think was going to read it. it oh, Daniel's got it. Go Daniel, Daniel had, had it originally, and then he put it back. Okay. I was going to go read it, but I don't know if it's still there. I don't know either. I know Daniel's a big uh, fantasy sci-fi kind of reader, which yeah. I was not expecting. So when I saw him reading his book, I was surprised. Have you seen the old Disney movie, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, with Kirk Douglas? No. I was, I was obsessed with that when I was a kid, too. It's really, uh, I like old movies anyway, but it's, I think it's pretty good. I do like classic movies. Wait, doesn't Kirk Douglas have like a famous son who is married to Goldie Hawn? There's got Michael Douglas. Can't remember who he got married oh, to. Oh, yeah, you're right. Michael Douglas is his son. I know Dr. Ballard credits uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for like wanting to do this, for telepresence everything. Favorite book, favorite movie, childhood inspiration. 1954. Hmm. I just recently watched, um, I went through a, gosh, now I'm blanking out on this man's name. 
The famous choreographer. Oh. Fosse. Bob uh, Fosse kid. Oh my gosh. Guess I... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, high school drama teacher studied under Fosse. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a tapping. Wait, hold on a second. Is it this sound? Are you hearing it now? Is it this sound? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? I, I am playing with a pen and compulsively clicking it, so that might, I'll put the pen away and see if it goes away. No, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> no, it's just a consistent uh, sound, which is usually, could possibly be yeah, the sound, sure, yeah, of comms. I'll double check. <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> no. I just wanted to see what the depth was. Were aiming for? Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought it was around like two thousand meters. So I was like, wait. Wait a minute. Chris, have you read War of the Worlds? Yes, I have. Are you watching your sonar as well there? That was like the voice of God coming out. Bottom in sight. Oh, bottom. Let's go. All right. And our first sea cucumber already has flown by. Yay. <laughs> I know, Brian, you're really happy. Now we can go back to science. Yeah, science. <laughs> Chris, tell me about world, War of the Worlds later on. No problem. Pins and needles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can you bring your head to uh, the northeast, please? And you can come on stop there. Oh, and that was in perfect timing because they just started their interaction behind us. Who? Uh, Megan and Adam. Oh, what interaction? Uh, it's like Ocean's Day. Oh, this is the Falcor. Yeah, with the Falcor 2 what? and the Hawaii Mu Museum of Bishop Ships. Museum. <laughs> the Hawaii Museum of Ships. No, it's the Bishop Museum. <laughs> like, like Bishop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Bishop Museum of something. But there's like back-to-back -back stuff That's going on. That's a good on. head there. Hold that for a minute. Well, the good news is there it are hard Come grounds. Down. Start coming we down can see the rocks already. Corley, are you like teeming with excitement? There's so many rocks right there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Super excited. <laughs> These should be at least be volcanic. <laughs> Ooh. No carbon for us. At least not yet. That's the hope. That rock sample that we collected a couple of nights ago, did y'all analyze what it is? Is it talc, silicate? No. Does I looked at it pretty in pretty detail under the microscope. I didn't actually do any, I didn't spray it with acid or anything, which you I didn't thought taste about it? doing it, and I didn't taste it. Well, it's going to be salty no matter what, because we just pulled it out of salt water. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I after looking at it, I'm pretty... genuinely answered that. It was going to be salty. I mean, it would be. <laughs> it wouldn't be a good diagnostic test, but unless I guess I could rinse it Keep with fresh water out. first and then see if it still was salty. Um, but looking at it, it looks very much like lagoon sand to me, partially lithified lagoon sand. And so my current hypothesis of that feature we were in was actually the channel connecting the, uh, the old lagoon, the relic lagoon, with the ocean. And so we were seeing the two uh, tips of two relic islands from when that uh, Gio was an atoll, and we were running up the channel that would have connected the central lagoon with the ocean. Oh. Is my current working hypothesis on that feature. That makes sense. Okay, can I hold that for now? Are we about ready for white balancing? Nope. Nope. Okay, right, I'll hold off. Oh 
Okay, okay Ren, you can uh, take a minute right down the uh, oh, bottom of the gauges picture. there. And for those of you who are waiting with bated breath to see uh, the bottom uh, oxygen concentration, there. we're back up Run to it. 100. <laughs> <laughs> you have DBL. Right. All right, so as we're coming down here to the bottom, for everybody that's listening online, we are at a depth of 2,475 meters. We are diving on unnamed EO number 13. So you got to do your reset thing, or are you happy there? I already did it. And we are exploring the western flank. One of the interesting features that we're hoping to explore a little bit about is that there appears to be a submarine oh, auto landslide XY. feature. And then auto Yeah, XY. it looks like this western, this little section of the west face is, is in the process of failing. There's a kind of couple steps down with a nice headwall scarp that we're going to eventually get up to, um, which we are currently think is, is probably a, a landslide in, in progress over geologic time. Oh, interesting. Okay, there. Also, those listening online, we, have, we do not have the Raman spectrometer on board because this is a deeper dive. And this is the sixth dive of the expedition. Hey, no. I'm reading the dive plan. It says sixth dive, but it's like the judging by your sassy side eye. Down, uh, I'll do it. I, I got it. You're busy writing numbers down there. I just there, finished. This should be the 14th, but you the first two were. The, uh, dive log there. Uh, the the non counting. And then oh, there was copy. a third non counting. So I think we've had, this will be our 11th. 12th, I think. We uh, had, I think yesterday 12th. was our 11th. Well, then you know what? Let's just scrap this whole dive plan. There? It says sixth dive. I'm going to really? circle it right here just in case anybody is questioning it. No, that Six. says 12. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I really had my pen up, and I was like, no, it does not. So as we're doing our white balance, some of the goals for this dive is to uh, survey and sample the, div the diversity down here. So that includes corals, right sponges, okay, fish, any other really cool critters down here. Um, collect a couple of samples possibly to learn more about the geology of this area because it's kind of an enigmatic area. So we want to understand more about it. How old it is? Why do they have these structures? What is its volcanic history? Okay, Brian, we're all yours. Sweet. Hurling it. The rock we can pick up anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Why is that funny? You would never say that. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> the bottom of the dive, you always pick up a rock. Get the rock from the deepest sample possible. We just don't have blue water that much. That looks like a beautiful rock right there in front of you, Corley. That's how I used to, like, when I used to collect samples. <laughs> I would always be like, as soon as you get down there, pick up a rock. So you're saying you don't want any rocks? Does that rock look at all interesting to you? That Is it an angular cantaloupe rock? It's definitely <laughs> not. But, I mean, if someone wants to pick up a rock, that's probably going to be the easiest one to pick up. I would think picking up a rock down here would be a good idea. Dan, can we poke that rock and see how uh, <laughs> how big it actually is and if it's loose? Right. Cool. Cool. Oh, okay. I was also going to say, can we try breaking off a spread? piece of that Copy. sheet? I'd be shocked if it's carbonate this far down. It's possible, especially in, in the slump feature, but that would surprise me. Do you think we could try? 
And then we can try picking up your rock. That rock's too big, isn't it? That rock's uh, pretty big. Hard to say. Yeah, it's probably too big. Yeah. Well, can we, while we're here, though, can we poke it and poke that? Uh, yeah, it's and it's cemented. Okay. Yeah. Well, you want to try and break? Uh, see if that's gonna break or was that? No, th test? that's an, this is enough. Okay. I well, think it's the same. Break. Like from this angle, it's the same as above. Cool. This rock is. Thank you. Well, let's try and keep an eye out for. Uh, but that was a beautiful a rock. rock. The relative out of all the rocks future. we've seen, Credit. that was the rockiest rock. <laughs> All the geologists acting surprised that I'm willing to help them. <laughs> Do you have a, um, a LinkedIn Kay. profile? Are you ready to get moving? Maybe. Because if you do all, uh, what do you call it when you like, endorse me, uh, you endorse, pro, pro I'll endorse rocks. you, helps yeah. geologists. Geologist. <laughs> <laughs> so Daryl, for finding this whale, could it be alive or dead, or does it have to be alive? Well, I never said specifically what. I mean, either one would be pretty cool. Okay. One living and maybe the other one in bone form. Either one's cool. Living or dead whale. I will take the same thing for the octopus. Living or dead octopus. to me. Yeah, let's try it. I'm dying. Damn, watch out for that jut that rock is jutting out. Why was that funny that I said that? <laughs> <laughs> Touching it. Daryl, can we get like a half zoom on Atlanta? Perfect right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Oh, yeah. That's a big rock. That's a big <laughs> rock. I don't think we need a rock that big. No. Oh. And... Yeah, it's bigger than it looked. It's a little rock. Crumbly. Yeah, it's too crumbly. I like to get a big rock right in the beginning. Are there any, are any of these, maybe? Okay. Possible. Keep an eye out for once. Can we go for a while now, Atlanta? All right. Off we go. Uphill. Uphill. Zero five five. Sure. Bridge nav. Can we move three zero meters zero five five, please? Thank you. now. Can we make that point two knots, please? Thank you. For those listening, uh, we do know about the little audio clicking 
uh, we are troubleshooting it right now. So not sure if this question is for Daryl or for uh, one of the ROV pilots, but on Hercules's right arm, there is that green piece of tape. Is that needed for anything? Because there's like a half piece of tape just kind of wiggling around. It's mostly to confuse me. <laughs> it's there just to mess with video. <laughs> yep, it kind of gives me an idea if, R if the RGB, red, green, and blue colors are consistent, but mostly to confuse me a bit. There's a sponge. First sponge of the night. First biological organism of the night. There's a floaty thing. Yeah. Near the end of the leash. Roger. Come down. Copy. I love this question so much. What is it like having the most exciting and the most boring job at the same time? Oh, it's both exciting and boring. <laughs> <laughs> you still want me to come down, Dan? That's going to heave me under the tether. Mm. No, if it's hitting you, uh, if it's hitting you, you need to come up. Copy that. A s a snap zoom from here should be good enough. All uh, right. Go ahead, Daryl. Uh, I gotta turn the lasers back on. Yep, I was about lasers. to ask about that. Thank you. All right, that's good enough for the back row, thanks. So for those online, uh, we started this dive around 4.30, 4.40ish, and we just made it to the bottom about five minutes ago. So for those tuning in, you have not missed much. Only one super exciting rock and a sponge. And Joe Cocker? I don't know that one. Oh, you'd recognize Joe Cocker. A little help from my friends. Oh. And you'd recognize the song. Okay. Oh, Brian, while you're here, we think we saw a really cool fish. Did you see a really cool fish? No. No, I was sitting with my back to the uh, screen downstairs. We didn't see the front of its face, but from the back, I might be crazy, but it looked like a fang tooth. It's totally possible. Okay, I didn't know if that was impossible, possible, but it had like that thicker, dark body. No, what, what are we doing depth-wise? We're not a thousand meters. Almost a thousand, um, yeah. We still got a while. You ready no, to converse on blue water? No, I just was looking, thinking how far out of the scattering like, where we were in relation to like the mesophotic. Um. Do you want to talk science, Brian? I always like talking science. Do you want to tell us about the Oxygen minimum zone. Sure. Uh, Are we there? Are we there yet? <laughs> we <we're, laughs> we got another thousand uh, meters. No. Are we there yet? In the oxygen minimum zone. Oh, we passed that up a while back, didn't we? Uh, we're still kind of in it. Oh, okay. Um, we saw. I think it was uh, 270 meters is when I noted that the max, the minimum reading, which is just about the minimum reading the vehicle is capable of, of one micromole per liter. For comparison, we started off at 259 in the surface water, and it got down to one. Uh, and now we are at, what are we currently at? We're currently at 32. So um, the oxygen minimum zone is, as the name might imply, just an area where you have very little oxygen. Um, and the exact depth of it um, changes depending on oceanographic and biological conditions in the area. Um, generally, it's somewhere in uh, the top thousand meters 
you know, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 meters is kind of where it most often appears. Um, and it's a, an interesting balance of, you know, lots of oxygen in the surface water where there's lots of uh, primary production and photosynthesis going on and in the deep water where it's where it's recharged by downwelling um, in cold water climates that eventually makes it down to the deep deep sea um, there's just not a lot of life down there burning up the oxygen um, so it's a little bit higher and then kind of this you know perfectly low point in the graph where you're far enough away from the surface water that you don't get a lot of oxygen out of the atmosphere or primary production, but you've got a lot of decomposition and stuff occurring in the water column from the um, animals coming down out of the surface water that you get a minimum. Um, and the oxygen minimum zones are expected to expand uh, substantially um, in a lot of climate change scenarios. And I'm going to get the headline wrong because um, I wasn't ready for the question. Um, but there was just a recently an analysis um, looking at the Eastern Pacific, um, basically from here east. And under some climate change scenarios, I think it was something like 9 billion square kilometer, cubic kilometers of Pacific Ocean was going to fall into uh, oxygen minima zone status additionally um, after uh, if climate change is left unchecked. And let me go find the actual number. Um, So if I'm understanding you correct, at the surface, tons of oxygen, in the middle of the water, low oxygen, and then at the bottom of the seafloor, lots of oxygen again? Not lots, but more than in the middle. More than in the middle. Yeah. So we had a question come in. How far from Palmyra are you? Uh, give me a second. And the short answer is far enough away that we don't get booby apocalypse again, where we have all the birds. Uh, we did the math earlier, and it was, I believe, 196 nautical miles. We've moved quite a bit um, at, down to the south. We're sneaking south and all that mapping. Um, so we're now right about exactly 100 miles away from Palmyra. So we're closer. Yep. And, and as the plan currently goes, this is about as close as we'll get. We might get a couple miles closer, but this, this feature we're diving on right now is probably the southernmost feature we will dive on. Um, but we might go dive on the very southern tip of it. And right now, we're kind of in the middle on the west side. Was that done intentionally to make sure that we don't have another bird apocalypse? No, um, not really. It was just that the area the previous dives that have been done in this area have all been done much closer to Kingman on Palmyra. So that area is much better documented uh, and still under documented compared to shallow water, but is, you know, at 30, there's been 32 deep submergence dives here uh, between Sebastian, Hercules, and Deep Discoverer, and 30 of them have been done inside the monument. Only two have been done outside the monument. So we really are trying to focus on the waters outside the monument because they're more or less completely unexplored. And how far out does the monument boundaries go? Did you say 30 miles? A 50, uh, that's 50. a square that's loosely 50. And so if uh, one of the actions proposed for those listening online is to turn this area into a marine national sanctuary, today is the last day that you can voice your, let your voice be heard. So if you go to nautiluslive.org, down at the bottom of the page, you will see in recent highlights a place where you can uh, comment on whether or whether not you want a marine national sanctuary made uh, from Palmyra. Uh, and I should clarify, it's 50 in all directions. So the box itself is about 100, 100 nautical miles on a side. So going back to the oxygen minimum zone, do organisms ever die from lack of oxygen? Oh, absolutely. Um, <coughs> in, in places confined, um, in confined waters, um, 
it can definitely cause like whole fish um, die-offs. So in fresh water, you get overturning stuff, and you can kill basically all the fish in a, in a lake potentially. Um, or it, the really famous Gulf of Mexico dead zone is an oxygen minimum zone, and that can move in and trap fish in places and kill, you know, millions of fish in one go. Um, out here, where it doesn't change as much, uh, it does. I don't think you see as much death associated with it because it's kind of a stationary thing. And so if the fish swims in it and finds that it's, you know, having trouble breathing, it turns around and swims back away. Mm -hmm. um, but in other, other environments, when you see oxygen minimum zones that come and go, uh, absolutely can have fatal uh, consequences. So it was, I found the paper, it's 8 million cubic kilometers of additional oxygen minimum zone in the Pacific. Uh, is possible under um, a couple of uh, one of the climate change scenarios. Wow. And like when we talk about sediment plumes, like kind of more <coughs> in relation to deep sea mining and stuff, one of the worries is that the sediment plumes will create anoxic environments, um, which just means there's no oxygen, um, which would have an effect on the benthic organisms. So that segues nicely into my next question. So since we're about to do a big kind of a oceans week, oceans evening thing here on the Nautilus, what is your top tip for helping the oceans? Um, vote. <laughs> <laughs> vote, voting for like, voting for people who can change things. Um, volunteering your time with organizations that are specifically doing work to decrease pollution in the ocean environment and voting with your dollars. So not paying or buying stuff from corporations that are actively polluting the oceans, which is a lot of them. So Coralie, you messed up. I asked for one <laughs> and you gave three. Brian, Chris, what are your top uh, top tips to preserve or help the ocean? I, I really have to second Coralie's. Um, and and I will just say, beyond just vote, but also advocate. And, and beyond just writing the occasional letter to a, <coughs> your elected representatives, but also like, you know, participate in, the pr in all phases of the kind of decision-making process of the, of the government, from responding to public requests for public comments, like are going on now with the proposed sanctuary, to you know showing up for primaries and things like that where in a lot of ways you often have more power per vote um and it, more than just showing up for a general election as well um, to try and influence candidates in the primaries and stuff like that where you may have a little more gray zone of a choice um so i think that's a really good one the the primaries showing up in the primaries that is a really, really hard one for so many of us, and yet it's the one that definitely, I feel, matters the most. Because by the time I get to the general election, it's it's pretty black and white, I feel, in so many regards. And the primary is when you can help shape it. So Chris, what's yours? Uh, well, I think that uh, all the changes that need to happen need to come from way higher up than one individual. Mm -hmm. So yeah, vote, like, put your, uh, support towards people that follow your beliefs on conserving and people that are thinking forward into the future as opposed to making money now people that are focused on a sustainable future and the other thing that i would um, mention would be what brian kind of mentioned earlier is that talking about it like if you you can talk to all of us have a relatively similar opinion that you know you want to take care of the environment and the oceans and all that but you need to talk to everybody like make it a part of your daily conversation it's the more people that are aware the bigger change can happen or the better change can happen yeah just that it and it's a reinforcing thing that just hearing your other friends who may actually feel similar to you um just hearing you reinforce your beliefs and what you feel can go a long way as well as you know, influencing people who may not share your beliefs uh, uh, one little step at a time. It's rare that you're going to have a breakthrough talking to someone and change their mind dramatically. But if everyone they hear around their social circles is all feels passionately about, 
you know, conservation and, and proper management of the environment, um, it, it, people's perceptions do shift over time. Daryl, do you have a moment to answer the question? I know you've been busy working over there. What was the question? Uh, since it is like Oceans Week or we have a big Nautilus Oceans evening, what is your top tip to help preserve or help take care of the ocean? Actually, I did a video earlier with Megan for our Instagram and I think TikTok. And basically I said, uh, when you're brushing your teeth, make sure to turn off the water in between. That's one way to help prevent uh, water wastage. That's a that's a good one. I was just watching a Nova thing, so I'm a PBS Passport member, uh, and they had an entire Nova documentary about groundbreaking ways to like help preserve water, and they did mention like the little things that we can do to help pres preserve our water. You don't realize how much water you waste when you have the water on while you're brushing your teeth. It's kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> Good one. Jay, thank you so much for your very kind uh, message. Congratulations on all your success. Uh, love that you're studying night areas. And yeah, thank you so much for writing in. All right, any wishes for this dive? I want to see an octopus. Anybody else want to see something crazy? I want to see a shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I want to see the lost city of Atlantis being run by Amelia Earhart. <laughs> I, I still think shipwreck is more likely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you said that with a straight face, too. That was pretty impressive. Yeah, the shipwrecks out here are much fewer and farther between, unlike the Gulf of Mexico, where you just trip on them sometimes. Why is that? Why does the Gulf have so many? I think it's just closer to shore and kind of a contained basin that was hard to get lost in, and so there was just more shipping traffic. I don't, um, 